Jesus Christ is Lord. So let's proclaim the name of Jesus Christ wherever you are. Don't be ashamed that you love the Lord. Don't be one of those Simon Peters that deny Christ. Just proclaim him. Jesus Christ is, is Lord. Lord. And this is Daily Bread. I'm Father Al Lauer, and we're just praising God. We are rejoicing. We have the privilege of teaching and living the Word of God. So right now we are on the book. And if I had a pick, if I had to pick a book, now outside of the New Testament, of course the New with the Gospels, you just can't beat those. But if I had to pick a book in the Old Testament, there'd be no question about it, the greatest, the greatest, now you probably disagree with me, but the greatest is Isaiah. Isaiah. That's just absolutely fantastic. You know, the church has always believed that. Christmas, Easter Vigil, Epiphany, all the fantastic days. We are in the book of Isaiah, going through Lent, the book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, the Advent, Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah. This is the book. We could do about 20 years of teaching on this, but we're going to just kind of pray and just get us started in this. I hope you just devour this book and read it over and over again. I would advise people to read the book of Isaiah, not just every year, uh, in addition to you know the the community services and things like that, but on their own, I would advise them to read it on their own at least a couple times a year because this is where it's at. Well, anyway, we're going to pray that the joy and enthusiasm I have for the Book of Isaiah, you would share in. And here's Vivian. Here's Judy. We're praying for you, Father. Right now, we just ask for a tremendous love of the Book of Isaiah a great application of this book, tremendous insight. Send your Holy Spirit, remove all obstacles, Lord. Lord, give us insight into this in such a way that our hearts will just leap with joy. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, as people read this, may they just surrender their entire lives to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Satan, you are bound. Jesus, you are Lord. We're just going to bless everybody, help you realize, who are you? You're baptized into Jesus. You're children of the Heavenly Father. You're bought at the price of Jesus' blood. You're temples of the Holy Spirit. That's who you are. When you know who you are, you will act differently. You will read differently, and this will mean a lot more to you. So I'm excited about the book of Isaiah. I hope you are, too. I guess you can tell that. I hope you can. Well, we, we approach these books in five ways. The key word, key verses, background, order, and approach. I'm going fast because I want to... Get into the book. Key word, key verses, background, order, and approach. The key word for the book of Isaiah, everybody knows it. Holy, 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 holy Lord. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. Isaiah had this tremendous experience after the death of King Uzziah. He had this experience of the throne room of God. He saw the Lord seated on the high and lofty throne with the train of his garment filling the temple. Seraphim, that is angels, were stationed above. Each of them had six wings. With two, they veiled their faces. With two, they veiled their feet. And with two, they hovered aloft. And this is what they cried to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Holy, holy, holy. That was the experience of Isaiah. That was his calling. That was his, how he began his prophetic ministry. This experience of the holiness of God. Now, what does holiness mean? Holy means set apart for God. Holiness means having the very character of God. 1 Peter 1, be holy for God is holy. Be holy in every aspect of your conduct. Hebrews 12, without holiness, we cannot see God. Matthew 5, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for holiness. The kingdom of God is theirs. Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be thy name. Holy, holy be thy name. Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God, his way of holiness, and everything else will be given to you. Holy, holy, holy. Holy Lord, that's what they're saying in heaven right now, even as we speak. That's the experience of Isaiah. That's the message of the New Testament. We must, we absolutely must be holy. 
We must be like God. We must have the characteristics, the character of God. We must be set apart for God and for God alone. All right, that's the key word. Now, the key verses, and wow, every verse is a key verse if you like this book as much as I do. But anyway, I already quoted. I'd say the main chapter of Isaiah is Isaiah 6. Here we have Isaiah's prophetic calling. I already quoted a little bit about it. And he felt when he went into the holy presence of God that he was doomed, that he was unclean, that there would be no way he could have anything to do with God. But then one of the seraphim flew down to Isaiah and had a ember, a burning ember, and he touched the mouth of Isaiah and he purified his lips. And then God said, Whom shall I send? And Isaiah said, Here I am, send me. And the Lord said, I'm going to send you, but I'll tell you, they ain't going to listen to you. And then Isaiah said, Well, that's going to be a pretty hard way to go. How long is this going to last? And God said, Well, as long as it takes. Well, that didn't really answer his question. But anyway, there he goes. And so, to understand Isaiah, Isaiah does some really weird things. Like, he walks around naked and barefoot for three years. That, I would call that kind of weird. I hope if you don't think that's weird, then you must be pretty weird yourself. Uh, you say, well, this guy must be nuts. Well, when, if you had chapter 6 happen to you, it's, it, it's uh, you know, you're liable to do anything. You're liable to do anything. He named his kids really weird names, you know. Uh, Maher Shalahashbash, <laughs> Sheer Jashub, you know, say, well, they're not really weird names. They just sound weird because I don't know Hebrew. If you knew Hebrew, they're, they're, they're still weird. They're still weird in Hebrew. Oh, gosh, they're, they're, really, they're really weird names. Uh, like uh, Sheer Jashub basically means um, only a remnant will return. It's kind of like remnant days. Now, how about calling your kid remnant days or leftovers? <laughs> you know, and say, what's, what's that little boy's name? His kids, his, what's your name, Johnny? My name is remnant days. <laughs> Okay, who, who named you? It's my, my old man. They say, well, something's wrong with your old man. No, nothing was wrong with him, but he had a tremendous experience of God. Just put it that way. Or well, the other one, share, uh, I don't know if a share, uh, how, I think I'm getting it mixed up now. Uh, Maher Shalahashbash. Maher Shalahashbash. Say, what's your name, little Maher Shalahashbash? And he says, <laughs> Well, my name, my name, my name means uh, easy pickings. <laughs> quick the plunder, quick the spoil. My, my name is easy pickings. <laughs> well, who in the world named that nice little boy such a weird name? Say, well, it's my old man Isaiah. And say, Isaiah, what put you up to this kind of stuff? Well, if you went into the throne room of God and saw what I got, I saw, if you had an angel come down with a burning ember and touch your lips, you probably would name your kids funny names too. Well, anyway, you won't if you anything in Isaiah that seems weird, look at look at chapter six, you'll say, Well, I can see what I can see why a person might do that after chapter six. Anyway, Isaiah seven, fourteen, here's a super prophecy. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. Matthew picks that up in the first chapter of the New Testament. And, of course, it turned out to be a prophecy of the virgin birth and of the incarnation of Jesus, of God becoming man. Isaiah 9, we read it every Christmas at midnight mass. Isaiah 9, 1, the people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light upon those who dwelt in the land of gloom. A light has shone. Jump down to 9, 5. A child is born to us, a son is given to us, upon his shoulder dominion rests. They name him Wonder Counselor, God Hero, Father Forever, Prince of Peace. His dominion is vast and forever peaceful. Hallelujah. You know, Handel's Messiah came out of that passage. All right. Isaiah 11. The passage that was the basis of the bishop praying for you when you were confirmed by the power of the Holy Spirit. It says, a shoot shall sprout from the stump of Jesse, and from his roots a bud shall blossom. 
The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, strength, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. His delight shall be the fear of the Lord. The power of the Holy Spirit in your life, the gifts of the Holy Spirit in your life, will reverse the deterioration of society through sin and take us back to paradise where the wolf will be the guest of a lamb, the leopard will lie down with a kid, the calf and the young lion will browse together, a little child shall guide them, and there'll be no harm or ruin on all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as water covers the sea. Yes, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit through your confirmation in your life is going to reverse all the damages of sin and give us a new world like even better than paradise of old. All right. Oh, this is so fantastic. I won't even read it, but read Isaiah 12, a fantastic song of thanksgiving. Isaiah 24, prophesying the end of the world. Great passage about the end of the world. Well, we could go over and over, passage after passage, but we'll just hit the highlights right now. Then we get to the second part of Isaiah, and this is Isaiah chapter 40, where Isaiah receives another call. Now, of course, this is much later. This is probably not the same Isaiah that received the call in Isaiah 6. Possibly it is. But it's someone later on in the school of the Isaiah prophets. So this book of Isaiah spans uh, from 750 about to about 550. It spans about 200 years. And so it's about a whole school of prophecy centered around this fantastic prophet, Isaiah. But the second part of the book begins in chapter 40, and once again there's a special call. God speaks. We're in the throne room of God, just like we were in Isaiah 6. In the throne room of God, God says, comfort, give comfort to my people. They have been devastated. They have been destroyed. They have been wiped off the face of the earth. They have, uh, they have been taken into exile. Now it's time for a change. Comfort. Give comfort to my people. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Proclaim to her that her service, her slavery, is at an end. Her guilt is expiated. Now it's all over. And a voice cries out uh, in this throne room of God. Maybe it's an angel. In the desert, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the wasteland a highway for our God. The beginning of the New Testament, John the Baptist used that as his cry. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill shall be made low, the rugged land a plain, the rough country a broad valley. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Then another voice says, cry out. And the prophet Isaiah, or in the Isaiah school says, what should I cry out? Your message is, all mankind is grass, and all their glory like the flower of the field. And then uh, someone else, an angel maybe, says, Go up to a high mountains, Zion, herald of glad tidings. So they got the whole country going up, represented by Zion. And the whole country cries out at the top of this mountain. And it says, don't be afraid to cry out. And cry out to all the cities of Judah. Here's your God. He comes with power, the Lord God. And of course, in a way, that's a prophecy of the Incarnation. They didn't think that would be literal, that God would actually come to earth, but he did. He did. Wow. Fantastic prophecy at the throne room of God. And it's a prophecy saying that even though we are devastated, even though we are grass, even though we are nothing, we got good news because God's intervening and bringing comfort and setting us free. Of course, the ultimate... The ultimate um, expression of that prophecy, fulfillment of that prophecy, is the incarnation of Jesus. Well, Isaiah 53, one of the greatest passages in the whole Bible, the suffering servant, the fourth of the suffering servant passages. I didn't refer to the other ones, but the big one is Isaiah 53, and a prophecy of Calvary, a prophecy of our salvation. Unbelievable, fantastic prophecy. Isaiah 61, when they asked Jesus what his ministry was all about, Jesus quoted this passage. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the poor, 
to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to announce the year of favor from the Lord. He also put in a little bit of Isaiah 42, the first suffering servant passage, and mixed it in with Isaiah 61, and that was the mission of Jesus. That was the mission of Jesus. When you talk to Jesus about what's he all about, he quotes Isaiah. When Matthew tries to begin the New Testament, he quotes Isaiah. When, when the church says, let's, let's fill these people with the Holy Spirit, they quote Isaiah. When the church is proclaiming the glory of God at the midnight mass, they quote Isaiah. When John the Baptist explains the plan of salvation, he quotes Isaiah. When you want to find out what Calvary is all about, you quote Isaiah. And, and I thank God, you talk about Presentation Ministries. The main passage, the prophecy for Presentation Ministries that brings you daily bread, that brings you these programs, and brings you our booklets and our tapes and all these other things. The main passage is, we quote Isaiah 2, so we're in good company. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 2, In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest mountain and raised above the hills. All nations shall stream toward it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us climb the Lord's mountain to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may instruct us in his ways, and we may walk in his paths. For from Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. We believe the presentation ministries is lifted up as a mountain, and people will stream towards it and receive the word of God, and also the word of God will come forth from it. And of course, that's exactly what God has been doing. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you just write in. We'll send you our book, The Presentation Story. It tells you all about presentation ministries. We'll send you our one bread, one body, as the word of God goes out, just as it is prophesied to the nations by Isaiah chapter 2. Okay. All right. Well, the background of the book, I already told you, 750 to 550 B.C., before the Babylonian exile and after the Babylonian exile. You see the two centuries of Jewish history that are kind of the microcosm, the miniature of Jewish history. You see the before, you see the after. You see God working with his people, and at the same time you see the devastation of his people, and yet at the same time you see God's divine intervention bringing his people back to him. Fantastic, it really gives you the plan of salvation. Fantastic. Okay. The order of the book. Now, there's so much we could say about that, but in general, there's two major parts. Sometimes people pick up with Isaiah 56 and say there's a third part there, 56 to 66. But in general, there's two major parts. The first part, first 39 chapters, say repent or be judged. The second part says be comforted and be restored. And the contrast between the two parts is very, very powerful. Very powerful. Well, the approach to this book, this is also the approach to all the prophets. Remember, most of this is poetry. And remember, it's not just poetry, it's drama. And remember, it's not just drama, it's what you might call mini-dramas. A lot of real little, little dramas, and it just hits you over the head, bang, 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 bang. It's kind of shock. Uh, theater, uh, where, where, it's, where they just hit you, and before you can even recover from this little miniature two-minute drama, they hit you with another two-minute drama, and bang, 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 bang. They even have what you might call rap music here in Isaiah. For, uh, you probably don't, you, it's in there. They call it, uh, in, in, the, in biblical uh, exegesis terminology, they call it the taunt song. That's what they call it, but nowadays we call it rap music. And they just rap away. They got a special little beat to it. And they, they, all this has got beat to it. Of course, we don't get the beat because we're, we're reading the translation. But it's all got beat. And of course, the Hebrew poetry is kind of bang, bang beat. It's real short lines. And, and it's got, and it's got um, real short words. It's, it's real, a lot shorter than English. English is more developed, more amplified. But Hebrew is bang, 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 bang. And that's basically the rap. That's basically the way they do the rap music. So um, I'm not saying rap music is, uh, is God's will. It depends on what you say. But, but the beat is in Isaiah. <laughs> and, even, and they used to, they would rap. They'd, they'd rap about the nations uh, that, 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 that had come against God's people. 
and they just they just really come against them and just say all kinds of stuff, you know, that that would uh, taunt them. And of course, rap music is kind of uh, taunting. It's kind of you know sticking it right in somebody's face and just giving them a hard time. Well, that's that's the way they did it. But you get some of this rap music, then you get these real weird dramas, then you get these crazy names and, and and people are doing all kinds of odd stuff and you just hit hit them with about 10 of these things in a row the order of Isaiah is not what you would call logical it's psychological it, it really tries to blow you out it's the theater of the absurd if you know what I mean and boy you just go through a whole series I like to see a good drama team really do these things right and boy, I'm telling you, you'd go through a couple chapters. By the time you were done, you'd have your eyes crossed. You'd have a headache. <laughs> you'd probably be pulling your hair out and saying, I repent, man, I repent. <laughs> well, as fantastic as this stuff is, it still didn't lead to repentance. It, it did kind of blow you out. But it didn't lead to repentance because, well, as hard, as tremendous, as powerful as a human being operates, Still, to touch the human heart, you know only Jesus can do it. Only Jesus. So that Emmanuel they talked about was the one who did the job. Well, anyway, there's so much we skipped over, but um, just by the power of God, I'm going to ask Vivian or Judy if they've got any, you know, just any verse they'd just like to talk about or any verse they'd like to pick at random to illustrate some of these points or a, person, a, a verse that's famous to them or means a lot to them or uh, just something that never made any sense to them. Well, bring up any verse you, you can bring up and uh, we'll, we'll try to comment on it and hopefully um, answer your question or illustrate some of the points and possibly what you bring up will be of help to some of the people who say, he didn't bring up my passage. Well, anyway... Uh, any, anybody want to just pick up pick a verse and we'll we'll say something about it. I just want to comment. You already mentioned this verse, but it's in Isaiah 40. It's the beginning of that second book where there's the hope and and it says here he comes with power, the Lord God who rules by a strong arm, and that's such a strong picture. And then the next thing it says it's like a shepherd he feeds his flock. In his arms he gathers the lambs, carrying them in his bosom and leading the youths with care. And there's such a gentleness. And it's just a beautiful picture of our God and his love for yeah, us. Yeah, the contrast between verses 10 and 11 in Isaiah 40, the arm, it just it really gets you. But you can read this a hundred times and you'll never notice it. Uh, you know, but then you'll, but then another time you'll notice that this, the Bible is so rich, a whole Bible is so rich, it just constantly keeps revealing the, the person of, of the Lord. But Isaiah, I think, is richer than the rich, you know. And you can just read this over and over again. You can read this thousands of times if you got live long enough. And, uh, and it just constantly just gives you more and more awareness of the love of the Lord. Any, any other verses you want to just bring up? Okay. Just phone your verse in. <laughs> I'm just going to pick one at random and hope that it speaks to your heart. Well, I got chapter 1, and I got verse 23. I better start 20, 21, because that's the beginning of a little mini-drama. And they're talking about the, Israel, the, the nation of Israel. How has she turned adulterous, the faithful city so upright, but now murders? Your silver is turned to dross, your wine is mixed with water. Now probably they were doing show and tell here. There probably was a person representing Israel who was dressed up kind of like an adulteress. Probably dressed in some sort of uh, pornographic outfit or something. And then, then, but right before that there's this picture of the city was faithful. But that one kind of falls over and the adulteress rises up. And here you say, gosh, what a terrible change that was. And then it says, justice used to lodge with her. Probably justice would be personified in the play. And so here's a Mr. Justice who shows up, and he was with this wonderful, a nice woman, the faithful city, and now he's stuck with his adulteress. And, and, then, and then all of a sudden, a bunch of people come in. They're murderers. See, a lot of these words are cues for the people to come on stage. You know, Of course, they didn't have big stages. They were doing this out in the street. This was street shock 
theater, you know. And then, then probably somebody gets this silver, and, and then it, it's all, you know, uh, mixed with bad elements. Then somebody mixes wine and water. Then it says your princes are rebels, so there are princes going in there causing trouble. And comrades of thieves, there are a bunch of thieves in here. Each of them loves a bride, probably the princes are paying off somebody here, and looks for gifts, and the guys say, hey, give me a little money. And the fatherless, they defend out of here on the side. There's this little boy, he don't have any parents, and, and then these, these people are stepping on this guy. And the widow's plea does not reach them. They're on the side, there's a widow. They're stomping on the widow. And then all of a sudden, after th this gross scene of terrible perversity, then the, then the, the Lord speaks. And then, ah, I will take vengeance on my foes. So it was a real setup, and boy, that punchline really punched you. So you, you know, you see how it works. Okay. Well, anyway, that that's just uh, one example. We're going to pray right now and ask the Lord to to do something special. Okay, Father, we just ask that we would accept your Son Jesus as Emmanuel, the Messiah. We pray that we would be in that remnant prophesied by Isaiah, the remnant that repents, that becomes holy, and is freed from the judgment and the destruction due to sin. Lord, Lord, may it renew our confirmation. May we pray that Isaiah 11 like our life today. Lord, give us hope and set us free from Isaiah 40. Lord, may our lives be described by Isaiah 61. Lord, may this book just come alive and set us free. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.